We want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. We want to say a very special welcome to a whole lot of schools this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. Whitney Young, L.W. Kahn, James Bowie, George Bush, Jerry Junkins, Martin Weiss, Eddie Bernice Johnson, Larry Smith, S.S. Connor, Ann Frank, J.P. Starks, Ben Milam, Sylvia Mendez, D.W. Truett, Barbara Jordan, Virtual Academy, Julian Saldivar, Sidley Lanier, Dunbar, and Uplift Meridian. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you enjoy them and hope that you get to come and see us in the future when we do have the regular field trips. Uh, teachers, if you're watching and you have not signed up, please go to www.tiny.cc slash pk-2 registration and sign up, please. Uh, the program today will be Force in Motion. During this virtual field trip, students will observe how magnets are used in everyday life and compare patterns of movements of objects. Ms. Ram will tell you about magnets, Ms. Ramirez about the way that objects move, Mr. Dominguez and Mr. Monroe will tell you the different ways that animals move. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Ms. Ram is going to tell you about magnets. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ms. Ram. And like Dr. Gorman said, I'm going to show you all about magnetism. So at the end of my part of the field trip, you'll be able to observe and identify how magnets are used in everyday life. Okay, so I have a main question today, and it has two parts. So how do magnets interact with other objects, and how do they interact with one another? So here are some types of magnets that you might have in your classroom and that I use here in the science lab. So I've gathered a bunch of objects from around my science lab that you also might have in your classroom or at home. So if you want to test out to see what items are magnetic, you can use these at home. So we are going to test them out by putting them in the middle of my work table and then bringing a magnet near. So first we're going to start with a little piece of wood. So I'm gonna bring my magnet close and the little piece of wood is not moving. So that tells me that the piece of wood is not magnetic. All right, so let's see, I'll try another one. I'm gonna put a paper clip in the middle and it is magnetic. The magnet is able to pick it up. All right, let's see, what do I have next? I have a little stone, my little rock, and my rock is not magnetic. It didn't move at all. Then I have a pipe cleaner for my craft box. And you can see it is magnetic. So my magnet can pick it up. Let's see what else I've got. Crayon. And while I'm doing this, you can kind of be predicting if you think it's going to be magnetic or not magnetic like this crayon. I've got a glass marble that I'm gonna put in this tray because it's been rolling around on me. So the glass marble is not magnetic. I have a little ring magnet like one you would get off the refrigerator. And it is magnetic. All right. And I've got a soda can. That's made of aluminum. Nope, not magnetic. All right, and I've got two more things left. So this one is a compass. So back in the day before GPS, or even if you're in the woods without a GPS or a phone to tell you what direction you're moving, you could use a compass. So the compass works with the Earth's magnetism. The Earth is a big magnet. And I can use a small magnet to manipulate the compass. So I want you to focus on the red arrow. And I can make the arrow move by bringing my magnet near. Now, if I flip my magnet around, the arrow flips around. So we know that the compass is magnetic. All right, let's see, what else? All right, 
So I've got iron filings. Now iron is a metal. And basically all this is is someone shaved off little bits of the metal. So it's kind of like glitter or something. So that's why I've got it in the Petri dish because we know that could make a mess. So I'm gonna bring my magnet underneath and let's see what happens. So I'm able to move the iron filings even through the Petri dish because the iron is attracted to the magnet or the magnet is attracted to the iron. Hmm. So I can move that all around. All right. So the iron filings are magnetic. All right, let's see what conclusions we can draw based on our results. So the non-magnetic items were the glass marble, the piece of wood, the crayon, the aluminum soda can, and the rock. Then the magnetic items were the pipe cleaner, the compass, iron filings, paper clip, and the other ring magnet. So I won't be able to hear your responses, but I want you to tell a friend, what do you think makes those magnetic items different? So what makes those magnetic while the others are not? So I'll give you a little second. Okay, hopefully you told your friends that all those magnetic items are metal. They all have metal. The pipe cleaner has a little wire inside and the rest are obviously containing metal. But you might be saying, uh, Meshram, that aluminum soda can, that's metal too. Well, not all metals are magnetic. So the main metals that are attracted to magnets are iron, nickel, and cobalt. Aluminum is not. So the soda can was there kind of as a little trick. But the other ones, so not all metals are magnetic, but iron, nickel, and cobalt definitely, definitely are. So we also need to discuss how magnets interact with each other. So we know how they interact with different materials, now each other. So you may have noticed that the magnet I've been using, my little bar magnet, has a red side and a blue side. So on your screen, the red side has an N and the blue side has an S. That stands for North Pole and South Pole. All magnets have a North Pole and a South Pole. But since these are designed for the classroom, they have them color coded so we know what side we're working with. All right, so we're going to see what happens when I bring two North Poles of a magnet together, a North Pole and a South Pole, and then two South Poles together. So back to the work table. Boop. All right, so I'm going to set my first magnet here and without touching it, I'm going to bring in the second magnet closer and let's see what happens. Du -du 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 -du. All right, so my North Poles are repelling. That means they push apart. You can see this magnet is pushing the other one around without even touching it. So if you were holding these magnets, you would be able to feel the magnetic force between them. They are pushing apart and repelling each other. All right, so let's see. I need to flip this one over to bring the South Pole to the North Pole. Let's see what's gonna happen. Boop. It pulls it along. So like the opposite, you can feel these ones kind of snap together between your fingers. They are pulling together. That means they are attracting. So now we're gonna flip it over one more time. And based on the last two that we just did, I want you to kind of be predicting, what do you think is gonna happen when I bring a South Pole and a South Pole together? So let's see, Oop. once again, that South Pole is pushing the other South Pole and it wants it to turn around so it can attract that North Pole again. So let's look at our little results. All right, so when we brought the North Pole together, they repelled each other, they pushed apart. Then when we brought the North and the South Pole together, they were attracted. Then when we put the South Poles together, they repelled again. So that tells me that like poles repel and opposite poles attract. All right, so let's talk about the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is just the area around the magnet that's affected by magnetism. So someone on the left took a picture of those iron filings we used before 
um, sprinkled all around the magnet. So you can see that it's strongest at the poles. That's why there's the most iron filings around the poles. And they kind of fall in line around the magnets to kind of show the shape of the magnetic field. Now, as you look further out, those little particles of iron are spread out more far, like further because they're less affected by the magnet, right? So they're up closer by the poles. And then as you get further out, they're less affected by the magnet until they aren't affected at all. Then on the right, you can see a diagram where someone drew it. So it looks a little more clear how the um, magnetic uh, forces flow through the magnetic field. <laughs> okay, so some examples of magnetic force in real life are compasses, which we've discussed. Um, certain trains called maglev trains use magnets on the bottom of the train and also attached to the tracks to propel them further. So they use both um, repelling and attraction to make the trains move forward. Then computers, speakers, all other technologies use magnets, electric motors, MRI machines. So when you go to the doctor, all those machines use magnetics or use magnets inside. And even when you go in your kitchen, all those appliances like your refrigerator, your microwave, all use magnet technology. All right, so my challenge to you is as you go on the rest of your day and explore your classroom or your home to find more examples of magnetic and non-magnetic objects. All right, I hope to see you next time. And thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Schramm. And we did have a question. Uh, name some metals that are attracted to a magnet. Metals that are naturally attracted to magnets are known as ferromagnetic metals. F-E-R-R-O, magnetic metals. F-E-R-R-O means iron. These magnets will firmly stick to these metals. For example, iron, cobalt, steel, nickel, manganese, gandolinium, and lodestone are all ferromagnetic metals. And now Ms. Ramirez is going to tell you different ways that objects move. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez. And in this segment, we're going to be learning about the different patterns of movement. So we're going to be looking at sliding, rolling, and spinning. Uh, so what we're going to do first, we're going to talk about the motion of sliding. So sliding is when an object moves across a surface and it ends up in a new place. So think of some examples where you have seen or experienced the motion of sliding. Now, the first example that comes to my mind is when you guys are playing on a playground, you guys might go on a slide. So you get to the top of the slide, you sit down, and then you slide across. And then another example, if I get a box that is super heavy and I can't pick it up, I will slide and push it across the floor. So that is a sliding motion. So see if you guys can think of some other examples. Now I'm going to show you some examples of objects that slide. So let me get my computer situated. So here I have an eraser and I'm going to apply a force. So a force is simply a push or a pull and forces can make objects move. They can also make an object stop or change direction. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take my hand, I'm gonna apply a force to this eraser and we're gonna see what happens. So I'm gonna apply a force. It's gonna be a push because I'm pushing it. Notice what happened. I applied a force, a push, and the eraser moved. Now the movement that you guys saw is called a sliding motion. So look around your desk and see if you guys can find an object around you that also will slide when you push it. Now you might have an eraser, but see what other objects you have around you that you can push along your desk. Now, whatever object you have, make sure it is sliding like the motion you see here. Objects you might have might be things like a book. So you can take your book and push it across the desk and you can see it slides. You might have a paper clip somewhere around you. You can push the paper clip and see how it slides. You might have a pencil you can push your pencil and see how it slides. Make sure you're sliding it and not rolling it. That will be our next word. But notice this is a slide. This is sliding. 
So the amount of slide depends upon the amount of force. So if you do a little push, it only goes a little ways and it's really slow. What happens if you do a big push? So go ahead and give your object at your table a big push. It goes much further and it also went a lot faster. Now notice when I'm pushing these things, they eventually stop. So what do you think is making it stop? So the force that makes things stop moving is called friction. And friction is a force that makes it harder to move things. So a rough surface has more friction than a smooth one. So again, practice sliding objects across your desk. Now, one of my favorite things I have here, this is a rainbow quartz. I like it because it's nice and sparkly, but it will also slide. So it's important to know that the shape of an object will determine what kind of motion it has when you guys push it. So make sure you find things that are sliding when you push it. So my next object that I have for you guys, or my next motion, is the rolling motion. And rolling is when an object turns over and over along a surface and it changes position. So it ends up in a new location. So think of some objects that might roll. If you guys play soccer and you kick a ball, the ball will roll along the ground into a new location. So again, try and think of other things that might roll. And I'm gonna show you some other examples of objects that roll. So the first thing I wanna show you is this cool thing. This is called a horse apple. It actually grows on uh, some of the trees that we have out here. But notice I'm applying a force, I am pushing it and it is rolling along um, around and around the surface. So this is rolling. Think of things like a ball. Notice the shape of this fruit. It's sort of like a sphere. It's shaped like a ball. So it can roll along the surface. Now find something around your desk that will roll. So hopefully you guys are able to find something around your desk that will roll. I'll give you guys an easy hint, pick up your pencil. So remember earlier we made our pencil slide. How can we make our pencil roll? So see if you can find a way to make the pencil roll. And it's super easy. You just turn it around the other way and you see this is the rolling motion. So hopefully you're able to see the difference between a slide and a roll. So that is rolling. My next motion that we're gonna talk about with you guys is the spinning motion. And spinning is when an object turns around and around, but it's staying in mostly the same place. So some examples of things that spin would be things like a toy top, but also our very own planet Earth will actually spin. So let's take a look at a globe. Here's a globe, it's a model of our Earth. And Earth actually spins around an imaginary line called an axis. So here's our imaginary line, the axis. And it's the point through which the Earth spins around. Now we know that that spinning is what gives us day and night. And the science word for spin is rotate. So rotate and spin mean the same thing. So if you hear me say those words, that, that, that is what it means. Um, so that's rotate or spin. Let me show you another object that spins and that is this pinwheel. So how do you think I can make this pinwheel move? Well, I can use my hand, but there's another way. So if these are outside, when it's super windy outside, the wind will push on these pedals and it will move. I could also blow on it if I wanted to, but I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna use our fan and we're gonna see how the pinwheel spins. So you can see the pinwheel itself is not moving. Instead, it's the pedals and they are rotating. They're spinning around that center point, just like our planet Earth. So this is spinning. So think about how is spinning different than rolling. So that is the spinning motion. We're gonna stop that one there. And then uh, the next thing I wanna do with you guys is just a quick little review of those three motions. So if you would like, feel free to stand. Oh, no, wait, oops, I forgot one thing. I forgot to show you some of my other spinning things. So sorry, guys. Uh, let me show you my spinning top and then we'll do our motions. 
So here's my spinning top and let me show you that spinning motion. So notice the top is spinning around that center point and it's mostly staying in the same place. It's not rolling around all over the place. It is spinning around that center point. Now look around your desk and see if you can find something that can spin. This might be a challenge for you guys because it's much harder to find something that can spin, but look around your desk, see if you can find something that will spin. Now, if you have a quarter or a dime or a penny, you can see if you can try and spin it. I was able to do it yesterday, but I wasn't able to do it today. But if you take your coin, if you have one, and you kind of twist it, you might be able to get it to spin. Again, I'm not the best at that, but you can play around with your change and see if you can make it spin. Remember that pencil from earlier? We said the pencil can slide. We said the pencil can roll. See if you can find a way to make your pencil spin. Now, again, I'm not the best at doing it, but you can go ahead and give us give it a try. See if you can oops, see if you can spin your pencil. And I've seen other people do it, but you got to do it super fast to see if you can make it spin. So your pencil can actually do three different motions depending upon uh, how you twist it or push it. So that is spinning. Now we're going to go ahead and do our motion. So now if you would like, you can go ahead and stand and we'll review those motions. So if you're standing, the first one that we're going to do today is the roll. So if you take your hands and just do this, this is a rolling motion. Now, when I was in school, we used to do the stop, drop, and roll. That is something you used to do if there was a fire and you happened to be on fire. You were supposed to stop what you were doing, drop to the ground, and then roll on the floor. Um, so maybe when you go outside for recess or after school, you can practice rolling around on the ground. That is rolling. The other uh, motion is a spin. So we know that planet Earth spins and Earth spins counterclockwise. That's the opposite direction of a clock. So we're gonna practice our spinning just like the Earth. So if you take your right hand and put it on your left shoulder, we're going to spin in that direction. So right hand, left shoulder, and we're gonna spin three times, just like this. Now remember, spinning, the science word for spin is rotate. And the earth is rotating around the axis, that imaginary line in the center. Also think of a ballerina. A ballerina spins in circles. And the last word we're gonna do is a slide. So if you take your hand and just slide one hand on top of the other, this is sliding. You guys are probably familiar with sliding because if you have nice smooth floors, if you take your shoes off and then you run around your house, you can slide on the floor. So those are the three motions that we went over. So I'm gonna share my screen with you guys super quick and we're gonna look at a quick little video of some motions uh, that my dogs are doing while they're playing. So as you watch the video, be thinking about what examples of rolling, sliding or spinning do you see? Also think about how does gravity and friction affect the dogs and the toys. So as I'm throwing those things in the air, what force is making them fall back down? So it's that same force that if you guys were to jump up, the force of gravity is pulling us back down. So when I throw those toys, gravity is pulling those toys back down. And hopefully you're able to see some good examples of sliding. So the shape of an object will help determine whether it's gonna roll like a ball or slide like what you see with that toy there. Here's my dog, Abby. And what kind of motion is she doing? Is she rolling, sliding, or spinning? Hopefully you guys said she's rolling. She's actually rolling in thousands of dead snails. Uh, that used to be a pond, but it, so hot and dry lately that the water evaporated. And then here we have a marble run. See if you can describe the motion of the marbles. And also what forces are in play. So think about gravity and friction. How are those things affecting our marbles? And a little challenge for you guys. 
uh, play around with some of the toys and objects that you might have at home or around your desk and see which ones will slide, roll, um, or spin. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen share and that's all I have for you guys today on motion. Uh, we're gonna give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. And a student asked a question, uh, how do things move? Living things can move by themselves. Things that are not alive move in different ways. Some things fall, some things roll, some things fly, some things slide, some things bounce, some things pour, and many other ways also. And now Mr. Dominguez is gonna tell you some ways that animals move. Hola amigos, en esta parte de su paseo virtual, vamos a explorar y enfocarnos en las diferentes maneras en que los animales se mueven. Los animales se mueven en diferentes maneras porque sobre el tiempo se han adaptado a vivir en diferentes lugares. Hi friends, in this part of your virtual field trip, we will be exploring and focusing on the different ways animals move. Animals move in different ways because over time they have adapted to live in different places. So we will be taking a look at some of the animals around our center and some of the animals that I own to see what special physical characteristics they have to get around. So let's get started guys. Primero, quiero explorar cómo nos movemos nosotros, los humanos. Los humanos somos animales y somos animales bipedos. ¿Sabes qué es un animal bipedo? Un animal bipedo es un animal que se mueve con dos piernas. ¿Puedes pensar en otros animales que se mueven con dos piernas? So, I want us to explore how us humans move first. We are bipedal animals. Do you know what bipedal means? Bipedal means that we get around on two legs. Can you think of any other animals that move with two legs? I'll let you think about it. Let's move on to the next animal. Estos animales de granja son cuadrupedos. Un animal que es un cuadrupedo se mueve con cuatro piernas. También tienen pezuñas especiales para moverse en este terreno lodoso y suelto. So guys, these farm animals are quadrupeds. And quadrupeds get around on four legs. These animals also have special hooves that allow them to move on this loose and muddy soil. Can you guys think of any other animals that move around on four feet? While you guys think of that, let's go on to the next animal. Ok amigos, el último animal que les voy a enseñar hoy es una víbora. Y nosotros sabemos que las víboras no tienen piernas, pero tienen cuerpos muy musculosos. Y son esos músculos que les ayudan a deslizar sobre el piso. All right, friends, so the last animal that I'm going to show you guys is a snake. Now, we know that snakes don't have legs, but they have very muscular bodies, and it's muscular contractions that help them slide across the floor, climb up trees, catch prey, and eat prey. So check out Pretzel. She is quite the animal, isn't she? All right, guys, now that we've explored how some animals move, I want you guys to be able to recognize three types of motion today. The first one is fun until you get dizzy, and that is spinning. So let me show you guys that one more time, spinning. The next one is one that I'm sure that you guys have experienced as well. That is rolling, rolling. And the last one is one of my favorite motions, sliding. Now, 
in order to see whether or not you are able to recognize these types of motions, I want to play a little game. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some animal clips, and in these clips, the animals are going to be moving, and I want you guys to tell me whether those animals are either sliding, spinning, or rolling. So let's get started. Okay, amigos, acuérdense que en este juego me tienen que nombrar el movimiento. All right, friends, remember that in this game, you have to name the motion. Les voy a enseñar unos videos de animales y en esos videos los animales van a estar moviéndose. Me tienen que decir si están rodando, deslizando o girando. All right, guys, I'm going to show you some animal videos and they are going to be moving in those videos. So let me know if they are rolling, sliding, or spinning. Let's get started. All right, guys. Are we rolling, sliding, or spinning? Estamos rodando, deslizando, o girando. ¿Qué piensan? ¿Y este lagarto? ¿Qué piensan? And what do you guys think of this alligator? What movement is it displaying? Finalmente, tenemos a mi perrito Higgs. ¿Qué tipo de movimiento está demostrando Higgs? And finally, we have my dog Higgs. What type of motion is Higgs showing us? All right, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this portion of your field trip. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you, Mr. Dominguez. And we did have a question uh, from a student. And it, the student is Royal Stetson from Mata School. And he asked, did the pipe cleaner have some kind of metal inside of it, a metal substance inside of it? Yes, it has a flexible wire inside with a fuzzy material around the metal. And it was used at one time to actually clean out old stinky, smoky pipes. And now Mr. Monroe is going to tell us other ways that animals move. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mr. Monroe, and we're going to look at some other animals and how they move. Now, a lot of the animals that I'm going to be sharing with you today, they're actually animals that we would find around the center and especially over in the post off reserve where we have free nature trails. I wish you guys were out here so we could take that little hike into the woods. And if you were quiet enough and you used your eyes to make good observation and your ears, you might get a chance to see some of the animals that inhabit the post oak preserve. Well, I have a few of those animals that have actually come from the preserve and we're gonna be looking at and investigating how they move from place to place. I'm gonna start out by showing you one of my favorites. This is Teresa. Teresa is a three-toed box turtle. And we do have those over in the post oak preserve. Now, when I'm walking with students and I actually find one, I will examine that turtle to make sure that it's healthy, that it's not injured, and that it's okay for me to release it back into the environment in which it is living. And I give the students a chance to look at it and examine it the same way that I looked at it. And then, you know what? I will put that little turtle back in the same place that I picked it up from. And I'll even make sure that it's facing the direction that it was headed. Now, listen, students, that little turtle was on a mission. Most likely that little turtle was looking for food to help it survive. Now, you know, a lot of times students are even uh, adults. When they find turtles, they get a little confused and they wonder, well, I wonder if that turtle belongs in water or if it belongs on land. Well, there's a very easy way to decide which. Simply by looking at the turtle's feet. In this case, if you look at Teresa's foot, I'm trying to get her foot right there where you can see it. 
she has claws. And those claws, guess what? They help her move from place to place in the forest. She can dig in or dig to maybe even look for food also with those claws. Now, this three-toed box turtle is a female. And you know what? I was able to tell that it was a female by simply looking at the color of its eyes. Around the pupil, it's a goldish color. And with this species of turtle, that indicates that it is a female. If it was orange or a reddish color around her pupil, the black dot there in the center, then most likely it would be a male. Boy, she is ready to go. She's ready to start crawling. And we call that motion, that movement of a turtle, we call it a crawling action, okay? Now I'm gonna put her up. Oh, let me ask you this. If I put her in the water, what do you think would happen? Well, most likely she would not survive. She would probably drown. But we do have turtles that live in water, don't we? And one way to tell whether a turtle lives in water, like red here, red is a red ear slider, gets its name from the red marks on each side of its head in the uh, location where most uh, animals have their ears, and that's how it gets its name. But red is a red ear slider, and he does live in water, spends most of his life in water, but can come out on land. Now, if red, red would stick his foot out here just for a minute you would see that he has skin in between his toes. We call those webbed feet, that helps him to swim. But he also has claws because sometimes they go through this action of when the ponds go dry like ours have, and I do know that we had a lot of these in our pond, when those ponds went dry, guess what happened to all the little red ear slider turtles? Huh. They started a mass migration a movement to a better place for them to live. And I don't know how they were able to find it instinctively, but they instinctively probably found another pond or a body of water to live in. So that's one way to tell the difference between a land turtle and a turtle that belongs in water. Web feet, but they still have claws because they're gonna get on land. Now. If we were in the woods today, you guys probably would look at me and say, what is Mr. Monroe doing? Because every once in a while, I'd go over and turn a dead log over or I'd scrape away some leaf litter and I would be looking for a very special insect or I would be looking for a myropod. Now the insect that I would be looking for is a beetle. And we know that insects, they don't have two legs, two feet, they don't have four legs or four feet. They have six legs and six little tiny feet like this best beetle here. Now this best beetle likes to live underneath leaf litter. I don't know whether you guys can see that. I'm gonna flip it around there. My hands are kind of wet from dealing with red, but that's a best beetle. And those mandibles, those large teacher looking apparatuses I'm not worried about this best beetle pinching me because he uses those to chew wood and his legs have barbs on them because they climb a little bit. Any obstacles that might be in their way, just like my finger, he's going on top of it. Man, they can really move, but they move real slow because you know a lot of animals, some animals move fast, some move slow. Even if something got after this one, I don't think it could really move that fast to get away, okay? Now, one of the things I want you to be thinking about, a question you might want answered or a question I'd like for you to be able to answer after I get through teaching you about some of these animals is that there are two ways beetles can move, some beetles. Do you know what those ways are? Well, let me share this with you. Some beetles can fly. Not very many, but some beetles can walk and only walk or crawl, okay? Now, there are two known beetles that I know that can fly. Uh, the carpenter beetle, carpet beetle, and the Japanese beetle. And both those beetles, oh, they're not very cool. They do a lot of devastation to people's gardens. Now, the Japanese beetle, we probably don't have to worry about them around here because they're up in the eastern part of the United States. But 
This guy here, he cannot fly simply because he doesn't have any wings, okay? No wings to fly by. I'm gonna put him back. Now let's talk about a myropod. Wow. Myropods have lots of legs. And this particular myropod is called a millipede. It has an elongated body with lots of legs. Oh man, check those. This guy, whoo, he is something. Now, this millipede, Milla is a Latin origin word that means thousand, peed means feet. So this little guy is supposed to have a thousand feet. Now, I don't think this one has a thousand feet, but it's got a bunch. And one way that we could probably find out is to count all the line segments that we see in this body and multiply that number of line segments times four because they have two pair of legs for each line segment in their body. And then they have little antennas that help them feel their way around. Makes you wonder whether they can see pretty good. And they just, their little motion or their movement is sporadic. They just go where they want to. And sometimes they can climb and move around, I guess with all those little feet, without the worry of falling. Like this one is clinging to my hand right now. So that's the millipede. Now, let's talk about some animals that live in water. Swimming from place to place. Well, this is a survivor from the pond. We collected a lot of fish to save them from the pond as it started drying up. We do know that a lot of the fish we weren't able to save, but they died. And fish are amazing, guys. They live in water and they swim from place to place using body parts called fins. And actually there are five basic fins that are on a fish's body. There's what we call the pectoral fin, which is located right there by the gills. The dorsal fin is that fin that you see on top. Hopefully you guys can see that. The pelvic fin is located under the bottom. And then the anal fin is located underneath it toward the, the, tail, the tail fin. Now that tail fin is called the caudal fin. All of those fins work together to stabilize that fish and allow that fish to go where he wants to go. Now, he's kind of limited. He can't really go in a straight line. All he can do is go around in a circle because of what he's, he's contained in. It is circular, okay? Now I will tell you, those fins are not attached to any bony structure in his body. Those fins are actually attached to muscle in his body. And that allows him to kind of move them the way that he wants them to move to help him move from place to place. Now, here we have another animal that lives in water. It's called a crawfish. I don't know whether you guys can see that pretty well or not, but crawfish, they kind of crawl around they can live underwater. They breathe there just like a fish using gills. But one thing about them, they can crawl and move forward by using their legs. But if something gets after them, they swim. Look at that guy. Boy, he can go. I mean, he's swimming around and he's swimming backwards, guys. Crawfish swim backwards. They use their tail and they flip that tail to propel themselves backwards, maybe to avoid being eaten by a predator, okay? Now, around our ponds at one time we had, before we lost a lot of water, before it went dry, we had an animal that could hop. And that's the way it moved from place to place. It would go what I call airborne. But when it went airborne, it was also hopping forward, giving a pushing off of its feet by using strong legs. such as old Hoppy here. Hoppy is an American bullfrog and I've had him for a while and boy, he's a pretty good sized bullfrog. Now he has very strong legs. Yeah, if I put him down, he could probably hop all the way across, well, about halfway the distance the, across this room, I would say. But you know what? When he's in water, he's an excellent swimmer too. And usually he's going to do it in a straight line because he can't change direction while he's in the air, can he? 
Look at these feet. Those are enormous web feet. You think he can swim very well? I think so, don't you? I think he can. Wow, that's old Hoppy. Now, one more animal before I, well, I've run out of time, guys. I sure hate that I don't have a chance to show you this last animal, but I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman. So if any of you have any questions, I bet he can answer them for you. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. And Kennedy from Kramer did have a couple of questions. First question was, what kind of snake did Mr. Dominguez use? And that was a ball, ball python, just like a ball, B-A-L-L, -A, -L, a ball python. And also, his other question was, uh, what is an MRI machine? An MRI scanner is a large tube that contains powerful magnets. You lie inside the tube during the scan. An MRI scan can be used to examine almost any part of your body, including the brain and your spinal cord. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to share my screen. During this virtual field trip, students observed how magnets are used in everyday life and compared patterns of movements of objects. Ms. Ram talked about magnets. Ms. Ramirez talked about the ways that objects move. Mr. and Mrs. D Mr. Dominguez and Mr. Monroe, sorry about that, talked about the ways that animals move. Thank you for joining us. Uh, teachers, if you would go to www.tiny.cc slash pk-2 feedback, fill out a very short form and send it to us. Thank you again for joining us. Have a